Yeah, so uh, I'm Matt Breton at Chupa Thingy. That's with a one instead of an I um, on Twitter. And uh, this is my super original talk title, Threat Intelligence 101. So that's me. Well, th those are my some of my pets. Um, the, the, the fish on the bottom right, um, he's actually looking for a pond home, if anybody has knows someone with a pond. I'm, I'm not joking. So if you, if you know someone with a pond, we have a giant goldfish that's getting too big for his tank. Um, he's like he's like 10 inches long. So if you, if you got a pond, we've got a fish for you. Yeah, so it's going to be all about the fish. So uh, a bit of a backstory. So recently I made a career change. Um, 2014, I started at the University of Iowa. Um, I was in charge, I did incident response, digital forensics, and Splunk. Um, early this year, I uh, moved to the principal financial group where I do threat intelligence and threat intelligence only. So um, pretty big uh, change in the uh, responsibilities there and kind of the direction. Um, part of my new job is figuring out how principal can leverage threat intelligence more. Um, and as a result, I, I realize I need to kind of really understand threat intelligence and, and kind of get to the basics of it and, and uh, learn those sort of things. So um, I endeavored to do that and uh, decided that, hey, you know, as, as someone with kind of this deeper background, um, I realized there was a lot about threat intelligence that I just didn't know. So um, I figured it'd be a good talk for other people that are, you know, likewise in InfoSec and, and not in threat intelligence. There's, um, there's a lot more to it than, than I really thought at first. So um, it's, it's also kind of interesting. Um, it's a, I'd, I'd say it's a bit of an outlier in the field of uh, information security. Um, like, like some other types of information security, it's, it's got a, a lot of ties to uh, military history background, but uh, Threat intelligence is maybe uh, more directly tied to the intel side of, uh, of military and government uh, work. And uh, it's, it's kind of a, a bit of a hybrid. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll get that from this talk. And um, one of the bonuses is, is I finally get to use my political science degree with a minor in philosophy. So where are we going? Uh, first, like I, I said, we'll talk a bit about that history. Um, then I'll go ahead and I'll define uh, cyber threat intelligence. Uh, we'll talk about the threat intelligence life cycle, uh, talk about levels of intelligence, uh, measuring confidence, analysis best practices, threat actor naming, and then everybody's favorite topic, attribution. So like I said, intelligence, intelligence is a positively ancient concept. Um, there was a there's a great blog post. Oh, and um, before I get further, uh, I should mention I I actually I, I made a list of every source I used for this talk because I really did rely really heavily on on a lot of publicly available sources. So um, I I attrib attributed the uh, any quotes I used and stuff, and and I I'll put up um, I'll I'll put up a companion that that has all the sources listed afterwards, so you guys can go ahead and check them out. And I I I'd encourage you to if you you're if you're interested, but. Um, so this comes from an uh, article by Ar Aram Bakshen Jr. called Spying Through the Ages. Um, it actually talks about this book by Christopher Andrew called The Secret World in Ancient History, or uh, Secret World, A History of Intelligence. Um, and he claims that the first books to argue that intelligence should have a central role in war and peace were The Ar Art of War uh, by Sun Tzu in uh, 544 to 496 BC and the Arthur, Arthur Shastra. I, I'm butchering that. Um, attributed to Kautilya, uh, senior advisor in the founder of the Mayan dynasty in northern India, um, around 350 to 283 BC. So um, we're talking BC here. This is this is an old concept. Um, and then uh, one of the one of the books that everybody said I should read to learn more about threat intelligence is uh, uh, Rebecca Brown and Scott Roberts' Intelligence Driven Incident Response: Outwitting the Adversary. Uh, they have a little bit about this where they say that intelligence analysis is one of the oldest and most consistent concepts in human history. Every morning, people turn on the news or scroll through their feeds on their phones looking for information that will help them plan their day. So uh, the basic premise of intelligence is taking an external information from a variety of sources and analyzing it against existing requirements in order to provide an assessment that will affect decision making. So um, there are a number of intelligence gathering disciplines. Um, 
and, and like I said, there's, there's well-established military doctrine surrounding of it, and a lot of that, that military doctrine is where uh, cyber threat intelligence comes from. So um, some of the disciplines are human, which is human intelligence, um, considered the oldest form of intel. Uh, can be covert or overt, so spies or diplomats. Um, uh, there's a lot of debate about whether human is actually relevant in uh, cyber threat intelligence. Um, some people argue that it can be if you're if you're speaking to a human, uh, interviewing a human directly about um, an incident that they were involved in. GeoInt is um, satellite. It's geospatial intelligence, satellite aerial photography, maps, GPS data. Um, it is. It can be used to provide context to cyber threat intel. Uh, MassInt is measurement and scientific intelligence, nuclear, optical, radio frequency, acoustics, and seismic signatures. Um, specifically excludes signal intelligence, and as such, it is not relevant in cyber threat intelligence. Uh, OSINT, I'm sure most people here have probably heard of that term. Um, open source intelligence, it's gathered from publicly available sources. Um, some examples of that are technical details that are probably accessible, like a Whois lookup or a GOIP, um, or, or maybe like a, a news report. Those are all forms of OSINT. SIGINT. Uh, signals intelligence gathered from intercepted signals. Um, the argument is that computers function using electronic signals, so anything from a computer or networking device is considered uh, SIGINT. So very, very, very central to uh, cyber threat intelligence. TechInt uh, sounds like it'd be relevant, but it really isn't. Uh, it's more about weapons and equipment used by armed forces and foreign nations. Cybint and DNINT. Um, these are kind of newer disciplines. Uh, they're they're, they're spin-offs of SIGINT. Some people argue that they're they're not they're, they're not separate. Some people argue they should be. Uh, that's cyber intelligence or digital network intelligence gathered from cyberspace. And then uh, finant, financial intelligence. Um, there are more, um, and and I did include some of the kind of newer ones. Um, the important thing there isn't really to kind of get argue about whether SIGINT is signal or not, but um, really just kind of understand that there are these kind of different categories and, and all the different places that you can get intel from that could be relevant. So um, that leads us into threat intelligence. Uh, I like this, this, uh, this description from Gartner. Threat intelligence is evidence-based knowledge including context, mechanisms, indicators, implications, and action-oriented advice about an existing or emerging menace or hazard to assets. This intelligence can be used to inform decisions regarding the subject's response to that menace or hazard. So, um, and we're not even talking cyber threat intelligence, we're talking just threat intelligence, um, which actually, you know, there they're technically are multiple layers. There's intelligence, threat intelligence, cyber threat intelligence. Um, but, I should have made that bigger. Um, so, there's this other description. Um, I, I know some people probably roll their eyes at this whole unknown knowns, known unknowns, and known knowns, but um, the, there's this uh, MWR Info Security that has this uh, threat intelligence white paper. Uh, pretty awesome, like I said, you all, I'll put the, the link to it up, but um, they talk about the, the idea of threat intelligence as um, kind of your goal is to move from this unknown unknowns to this known, known knowns. So an unknown unknown, the example they use is the uh, CEO is going to be attacked outside the office, but we don't know that. So that's an unknown unknown. Um, a known unknown is we know the CEO is going to be attacked outside the office. We don't know anything else. Um, and then a known known would be we know who's going to attack the CEO, where, when, how. Um, and, and that allows us to actually do something about it. Um, so that's threat intelligence. It's trying to get from, you know, you raise your maturity from we don't know what, what our threats are to we know what they are and we know what they're going to be. So uh, key, intel key objectives of a cyber threat intelligence program. Um, this comes from a blog post by Amal Monave. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but um, cyber threat intelligence, next big thing. It's a good blog post. It's, it really kind of covers um, kind of basics of threat intel. This is what it is. Uh, this is how you do it. Some sources, stuff like that. Um, and I thought, I thought he had a really good um, description of kind of generic objectives of CTI. So, uh, first one is to stay up to date with overwhelming volume of threats, including vulnerabilities, targets, bad actors, and their methods. Number two, help you become more proactive about potential cybersecurity threats to your organization. Oops, went too far. 
And number three is to keep leaders, stakeholders, and users informed about the latest threats that would potentially damage business financially or reputational loss that may occur. I should be using this anyway. So um, if you take nothing else from this whole presentation, uh, this is what you should understand. Uh, data is not threat intelligence, period. Um, so this comes from a, um, um, information comes from a blog post by Robert M. Lee. And um, this, this picture, this diagram, the relationship of data information intelligence comes from a uh, military publication called uh, Joint Publication 2.0, Joint Intelligence. Um, and uh, it won't be the first time this comes up. But um, so on the left there, you see operational environment. And this is a kind of a focusing. Um, those are supposed to be lenses that, that represent processes and kind of focusing this. So operational environment, every organization has one. Uh, physical location of your organization, networked infrastructure, interconnections with other networks, et cetera. Um, your operational environment contains more data than could ever possibly be fully collected, generally. Um, so what you need to do, uh, you drive your collection efforts, which is that first lens, um, by tools, reach into your operational environment and get data. Um, you, you, you need your analysts, you kind of need to be uh, aware of what data you want to get as that collection. Um, but collect from your operational environment, that gets you data. So then you have your raw data, which is processed and exploited, which is that second lens, into more useful information or into more useful form, creating information. And I forgot to advance my slide. Uh, so data is a factor statistic. Um, an example of that would be a, a packet capture. Um, through the process and explo uh, exploitation of that data, you get information. Information is processed data in an intelligible form. An example of that would be an IDS alert. An IDS alert um, information can have a sample of data. So most of the times when you get an IDS alert, you'll, you'll have a relevant PCAP which is a sample of that data that generated that alert. Um, and then it can have some context, um, even as minimal as a signature that tells you what, you know, what fired. So information can give you a yes or no answer. Um, you know, is this malware in our environment? PCAP says yes, or uh, IDS alert says yes. Um, further moving beyond the information, um, multiple sources of information can be analyzed and produced um, together in order to make an assessment called intelligence. So intelligent, intelligence then is an assessment of, an assessment based on various sources of information analyzed together. Um, the example I used is, uh, you know, APT blank is in the house. Um, you get enough, um, you get enough information that, that kind of corresponds to techniques, tactics, procedures. Uh, you can make some sort of determination about this is, we're under attack, this is what's happening. And that would be intelligence. So um, one of the more common, uh, a, lot of, a lot of places, are, uh, a lot of dis places don't make the distinction between data information and intelligence. More commonly, you'll see data intelligence. So next thing is the threat intelligence cycle. Um, so looking for uh, examples of the threat intelligence cycle, um, came across a few different representations. Um, in retrospect, I, I don't know why I put those in. I think I was just showing, like, hey, there's different stuff. Um, you can't really read it, but the, um, the steps are the same. Uh, they're just kind of slightly different laid out, different, different color, obviously. Um, I don't actually like either of those because they don't have six steps. Um, that's the one that the joint intelligence pitch is. That one looks like an orange. Um, so the evaluation feedback kind of all-encompassing. But um, the one that I decided to use is from Scott Roberts, again. Uh, this is from a blog post he did, Intelligence Concepts, the Intelligence Cycle. Um, and he kind of, he, he did a great, great, great job of laying it out. So um, first is your direction. Direction is defined as the, uh, the question to be answered. So uh, the example that he uses is who is the comment crew? Um, he decides that he needs to have a general understanding of the group, such as their goals and any, indica any understanding of um, any indicators compromise that could help identify them. So next step then is collection. Um, collection is where the data um, is, where data that can answer the question is gathered. So um, collection, common sources might be Google, vendor reports, uh, domain tools, virus total, passive total, some, you know, OSINT. Um, and once you've collected your data, 
uh, you go into processing. Processing is a step where you put the data in a consistent format to ease analysis. Um, and he describes it as uh, he gathered reports and articles related to Comet Group um, or Comet Crew, and he processed them into JSON as a as a standard format. That's that's his procedure. Um, and then he he pushed that data into his intelligence management system, um, also threat intelligence platform or TIP. Um, once you have your data all processed, go into analysis. So analysis is the key step. That's where the process data is synthesized together into an answer. Um, analysis is where you get a general understanding. Um, he, in his example, he, he decided, uh, in this example, he'd use a long form report. Um, so he said in this case, he'd want confirmation from more than one source. Um, IOCs, he has literally thousands at this point. Um, but he, the important part of analysis isn't just having those IOCs, but having them in a useful format, having context, um, including deconfliction. So um, that's what he did in the analysis step. Next is dissemination, uh, which is where the analyzed data, which is now intelligence, is shared with relative or relevant stakeholders. So um, key points, uh, different stakeholders will need different formats. Um, so in the case of your, your kind of technical group, um, your engineers, your analysts, they're, they're probably going to want, um, we'll get more into the levels of, uh, of uh, intelligence next, but they're going to want CSVs. They're going to want uh, something something structured that they can they can import and they can work with programmatically, uh, JSON, CSV, something like that. Uh, whereas your executive suite, they're they're probably going to want a, a, a prose. They're going to want a long form report, probably PDF document format. So um, the important thing there is to understand your your stakeholders and and kind of know what what language they speak. Uh, last step then is feedback. So um, Feedback is where the stakeholders return feedback on whether the question was answered. Um, if yes, does it lead to new questions or direction? If no, how do you generate a better question or collection in the first place? Um, another, another representation of that is uh, this one comes from a recorded feature blog post. Um, and this I like this one because um, while it's important to understand it is kind of this cyclical um, process, this shows kind of the interaction with uh, between the threat intelligence there in the middle, and along the top you see the collection, which is internal sources, technical sources, human sources, um, and and the important thing there is is the lines go both ways. So, um, like for example, your collection results can and will dictate additional collection steps. So your your collection can drive where you go with the with the further direction or further collection. Uh, then the processing analysis and dissemination are kind of internal there. But then you see that, that dissemination to those different groups and the feedback. Uh, again, you see that, that double-sided arrow. So that's, that's a, you know, the important thing there is to, to have that conversation, get that feedback. So next is uh, levels of intelligence. Um, so I'll talk about it a little bit more, but uh, some, some, um, I forgot to touch on this, but um, one, th one common thre thread you'll see here is that it isn't really as concrete and consistent in threat intelligence as, as it is in, uh, say, a lot of uh, some of the other um, InfoSec disciplines. So um, there are competing frameworks in a lot of cases, and um, there is no right answer. Um, really, it's, it's more important that, that your threat intelligence group is consistent within, within itself. So. Um, levels of intelligence, there can be four, there can be three. Um, we'll start on the upper left there. This mat I like this matrix because it's got uh, low level to high level on the bottom, and then it's got short term to long term on the, the side. And this again comes from that MWR, Info Security Threat Intelligence uh, white paper. So long term and high level, that's your strategic intelligence. Um, that's high level information on changing risk, and uh, that, that typically goes to your board, to your, uh, your um, executive suite. So unlikely to be technical, and it can cover such things as financial impact of cyber activity, attack trends, and areas that might impact on high-level business operations. Um, staying on that high-level side and going more short-term um, can be referred to as operational intelligence. This is the one that sometimes uh, people don't include in their, their levels of intelligence. Operational is typically the one get, that gets dropped. And the reason for this is that operational intelligence is rare. Um, operational intelligence is uh, details of a specific incoming attack. Um, 
majority of the cases, the only the only groups that are really going to have access to operational uh, intelligence are going to be you know nation states. So um, they're the only the only groups that are really going to have that infrastructure necessary to collect that type of intelligence. Uh, it, and a, a good an exception to that might be um, in the case of like hacktivists. Um, you know, if you if you know that your company is treading in an area where where retaliation is is likely, that that might be an operation uh, uh, an example of operational intelligence. Um, going to low level, but back up to long term, is tactical. So tacticals, attacker methodologies, tools, and tactics, and that typically goes to your architects and system mid level. Uh, those are your TTPs. So uh, you often get that from reading white papers or technical press, communicating with peers. Uh, developing it based on your own observations, um, and or you could purchase it from a provider. And then lastly is um, probably what most people are familiar with, uh, low level and short term, that's your technical intelligence. Those are your indicators. Uh, those are atomic and computed indicators, IOCs. Um, things like IPs, file hashes, um, you know, email addresses, stuff like that. Those are, those are technical, that's technical level intelligence. Uh, typically very short-lived, especially um, when you're dealing with like the broad-based cybercrime, mal spam stuff. Uh, Emotet technical uh, intelligence may tops is good for like 72 hours. Um, so, um, and a lot of cases, that's what a threat feed gets you is that technical intelligence. So, uh, next, talk about uh, a little bit about um, enriching your or explaining your intelligence. Um, there's this idea of words of estimated probability. Um, everybody's seen these, whether you've kind of realized what the scale is or not. So um, this up here, that this is the first example, uh, first attempt to kind of come up with a framework for words of estimated probability. This is from Sherman Kent. Uh, he's often referred to as the father of intelligence anal analysis. Uh, he proposed this as kind of a way to map quantitative odds to, um, or probabilistic statements to quantitative odds. He referred to it as um, allowing the, the poets and the mathematicians to speak together. Um, he came up with this in 1966 for, uh, in or for the use of na na uh, national intelligence estimates. So national intelligence estimates, um, those are produced by the National Intelligence Council, NIC, um, and they expressed according to judgments of the United States intelligence community. Um, I'm gonna show a little bit from one in a, in a moment. It's gonna be, uh, High like very, very high level, um, very important intelligence analysis. The, uh, the one example I'm gonna use is actually the, um, it was about Iran and whether uh, Iran's capabilities regarding uh, developing nuclear weapons in 2007. So that's, that's an example of a national intelligence estimate. Um, so anyway, um, this, this is the original, um, certain, almost certain probable chances about even and, and I don't really like the way it's described. So almost certain is 93%, give or take about 6%. That's, that's confusing to me. I don't, I don't like the way that it's laid out. Um, so uh, next attempt here, this is actually, uh, like I said, this is from that 2007 uh, National Intelligence Estimate that was titled Iran, Nuclear Intentions and Capabilities, um, in which they laid out um, these estimates of likelihood. Um, I forgot to put it in the slide. I think it's in the next one, but but this is actually in a section in the report. Um, it's uh, something like um, we mean or what we mean when we say we mean is is the, the title of the section, and um, it's it's supposed to clarify, but I think it's kind of confusing again. But um, 2007, these are the national intelligence ones. Go from remote to almost certainly, even chance there in the middle, probably likely, very likely, unlikely, very unlikely. Um, and, but, but then they qualify it even further and they say that they can use might or may, we cannot dismiss, we cannot rule out. And um, from the, the Wikipedia article on this, um, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, I actually went back because I liked this quote and I'm like, where did this come from? And I went back and I looked at the edits to the, the Wikipedia page and I went back to the original page and it was in the original page and it wasn't uh, attributed to anyone. Um, so I'm like, okay, who's the author? And I looked it up, and the author, um, they, they had a, um, I can't remember what the, the, the user was, but it's, it's French for yellow jersey, which is, it's a, it's a cycling thing. Um, but then their description was they were a graduate student at the Mercyhurst College. And I'm like, ah, gotcha. So um, the, 
I put down Mercyhurst College actually criticized these particular, particular words of SSA probability. Um, they said an agency-sponsored WEP program is progress. However, an, es an estimative statement that uses maybe, suggest, or other weasel words is vague and symptomatic of the problem at, at hand, not a solution. So kind of harsh. But um, they are very invested in the idea of uh, ways of uh, applied intelligence. They actually have an applied intelligence uh, program. And um, you're going to start seeing a little bit of them. So. Um, first example here actually comes from a master thesis from Rachel F. Kesselman for Mercyhurst College in 2008. Uh, it was entitled, The Verbal Probability Expressions in National Intelligence Estimates, A Comprehensive Analysis of Trends from the 50s through post 9-11. Um, fascinating paper, 115 pages, um, publicly available. I went ahead and I, I did not read the whole thing, but... Um, Pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, one, of the, one of the first things sh that she says that she did not expect to find is the most used estimative word historically in national intelligence estimates was will, which is kind of kind of interesting because a lot of people accuse national intelligence estimates of kind of not really saying anything, but the most used word was will, which indicates something will happen. Um, so, but she proposed in her conclusion uh, shifting to these words, and she argues that um, it includes seven words of estimated probability, which is in line with what Kent and the NIC have proposed, um, but most importantly, the list uses words that have large groups of uh, people perceive in similar manners, and she has the research to back it up. Uh, for example, she, she states something about how um, uh, weather, people watching a weather forecast in Juneau, Alaska, um, put highly likely at about the same probability as doctors in Miami, Florida. So it's it's huge body of knowledge to back this up. Um, I like these. So, um, and I think the, the kind of likelihood there is easy to read. Um, it's kind of easy to understand. Highly likely, more likely than likely. Almost certain, everybody kind of understands what that means. A little better or less. Unlikely, hugely unlikely, and remote. So um, the important thing, though, is just to be consistent, again, within your own program. Um, you don't, you don't necessarily have to pick a framework. It could help, but um, consistency. So um, analytic confidence, this goes hand in hand with those words of estimative probability. This is uh, kind of a, um, a national intelligence estimate thing, National Intelligence Council. And yeah, that's, that's what this section means there, what we mean when we say an explanation of estimative language. And this is what probably everyone's seen at some point. Uh, high confidence, moderate confidence, low confidence. We have high confidence, we have moderate confidence. Um, and they, they define those. Um, so high confidence generally indicates our judgments are based on high quality information. The nature of the issue makes it possible to render a solid judgment. It's not a factor of certainty, however, and such judgments will carry a risk of being wrong. So again, they, they have this tendency to say, we mean this, but there's room for interpretation. So. Um, Again, there's, there's criticism of the system. Um, it's not perfect, but um, the, the important thing is that the National Intelligence Council says, we have these standards, these words mean these things, they kind of mean these things, but um, it's, it's better than nothing, so. Um, but yeah, so these, these analytic confidence ratings are actually paired with statements using estimated probability to make it, um, you know, even more interesting, so. An example that I pulled out of that 2007 report that I was just like, what the hell, um, is we judge with moderate confidence that the earliest possible date Iran would be technically capable of producing enough HEU, which is uh, highly enriched uranium, for a weapon is late 2009, but that is very unlikely. So moderate confidence, very unlikely. Like, how do you, how do you work that together? Um, so anyway, um, scientific methods for determining analytic confidence remain in infancy. Um, this is another part where I think uh, somebody from Mercyhurst wrote this uh, Wikipedia article. Um, but they have, uh, they have a framework that they use. Um, they have a kind of a, a simpler one. Um, but there's actually a, an interactive spreadsheet that you can use. And uh, that's it right there. So you can actually go in here and, and determine uh, the use of your structured m methods in analysis. You pick which one of those, and it assigns a point value. And then you take your... Um, you know, source collaboration agreement level of conflict amongst sources. Um, you put this in, and it it tells you mathematically what your uh, what your what your statement should be, what your level should be. So, 
Um, pretty interesting. Like I said, it's th competing frameworks, definitely. Um, by no means a standard. Uh, next comes intelligence source and information reliability. Uh, this comes from Field Manual 2-223, Human Intelligence Collector Operations. Um, and, and this is a matrix also. So um, this was created by John Godfrey when he was director of the Naval, Naval Intelligence Division around the time of World War II. Um, this is actually used uh, across NATO. So um, it's, a, it's also referred to as the Admiralty System or NATO System. It's used by NATO member nations and members of the Five Eyes intelligence community. Um, so on the left there, that first table is your evaluation of your source reliability. And that goes, that's from A to F. It goes from reliable all the way down to cannot be judged. Um, the table on the right then is your, the evaluation of the information content. So left is your source, right is the information they're giving you. Um, and then on the right, that goes anywhere from one to six. One is confirmed, six cannot be judged. So um, confirmed information from a reliable source would be labeled A1. Um, inconsistent illogical information from a known liar, that would be E5. And kind of anywhere in between. So you could have, um, you know, improbable information from a usually reliable source would be B5, for example. So um, this one's closer to being a standard. Um, now I'm not, I'm not um, saying that you have to go out there and, and kind of assign a uh, matrix um, score to every every source you might be getting your intel from, but um, this kind of feeds into the idea that that you should be looking at the reliability of your sources. This is more for for human sources, but um, you know, for for those of us out in out in the field, look at look at the reliability of your your news sources. Um, you know, are you getting are you getting uh, news on a recent event from Brian Krebs's site? Pretty. You know, he's pretty good. He's pretty consistent. Or, um, you know, do you get your news from Zergnet? Nah, not as good. So, so that leads into analysis best practices. Um, there's a really awesome blog post by Sergio, and I'm going to butcher his name, Caltegaroni. Um, he, I believe he's the CTO of Dragos. Um, and he has this article called 15 Things Wrong with Today's Threat Intelligence Reporting. Um, and he kind of goes through some of the uh, issues that he sees and kind of pulls them apart. Um, and the point that he makes is the risk of bad intelligence is high. Uh, bad decisions can easily be made from poor intelligence, potentially doing more harm than good. Good, good analytic practices improve analysis, thereby increasing the risk of, or decreasing the risk of poor intelligence. Um, that's a quote from him. And then he also says, you could have the best packet analysis skills in the world, but if you cannot communicate your conclusions effectively to those who need to act on your information, those skills are effectively useless in threat intelligence. So, a bit kind of harsh, but, um, you know, this, this is a guy who knows threat, in, threat intel. Um, and if you can't read it, that's the, uh, the, the meme he has at the top of, of the page. It uh, says, nice hypothesis you have there. It'd be a shame if someone were to test it. So, um, I went ahead and I, I kind of broke down his article. I, again, encourage you to read his article. It's, it's not long. But um, I broke it down into some of his main points, uh, some of the do's and don'ts. So for these are some of his analysis do's. Uh, number one, follow logical progression. So he says, ensure evidence supports your conclusions and the logical reasoning is clear. Uh, the point he makes is that you should have um, evidence to back up your conclusions and, and the reader should be able to follow it without any sort of, you know, without being like, okay, what, how do you get here? Um, second, use words of estimated probability. You know, we talked about that a few slides ago. Um, he says, good analysis will have a proper mix of data and fact, hypotheses and conclusions. The confidence values of those conclusions vary, and, and it's your job as an, as an analyst to, to properly um, communicate those confidence levels to the reader. Uh, last, last do I pulled out of there, he said, um, I really like this one, include contrary evidence. Um, so his quote, practice analytic honesty. If there is exculpatory, ah, I butchered that, evidence, contrary evidence or a, an alternative hypothesis, show it. Um, and, and he makes the point of, you know, you, that um, your, your analysis and your conclusions should take that, that that contrary evidence into account and, and should be able to stand up to that contrary evidence. 
So, you know, if there is contrary evidence and it's significant, don't hide it. You should include it in your report. Um, the most important thing is for you to, um, you know, include anything that's relevant. That leads into some analyst don'ts. These are fun. So uh, first is don't mix up your facts, hypotheses, and conclusions. Those are very different things. Uh, he says when the three are confused, it can lead to erroneous assumptions by co consumers and lead to decisions made on weak conclusions rather than facts. Don't want to do that. Next is don't use weasel words. So this is the second time we brought up weasel words. Um, some explanation there is uh, weasel words can be numerically vague expressions. For example, some people, experts, many. Um, use of passive voice to avoid specifying an authority. Um, for example, it is said. That is a weasel word. Or those are weasel words. Uh, or ad adverbs that weaken. For example, often, probably. Um, the idea is that, that these words really just don't mean anything when you get down to it because uh, you, try and, you try and hold up, hold someone up to something they said and they say, it is said, well, who said it? You know, and, and they, they can't, you know, it's easy for them to say, well, I don't know, it is said. So don't use those words, they're terrible. Uh, don't use hyperbole. Um, an example of hyperbole, the bag weighed a ton. So the bag doesn't actually weigh 2,000 pounds. Don't use hyperbole, it's confusing. You wanna be, you wanna be precise, you know. Um, and then lastly, don't use logical fallacies. Um, this, I really like this part, so. Um, logical fallacies are defined as reasoning that is evaluated as logically incorrect. Um, and there is a awesome Wikipedia article that talks all about all the different logical fallacies that you could possibly use. Um, there are different categories. There's formal or informal. Um, some of the ones that you've probably heard of, um, and maybe, maybe you didn't even realize that they're logical fallacies, but uh, cherry picking, that's, you know, picking data that supports your claim. Um, false attribution, um, false equivalence. I like that meme. We have a false equivalency on the field. Just because two things share a single trait doesn't mean they are the same thing. So that's when you describe a situation of logical and apparent equivalence when in fact there is none. Um, you try and say these two things are, e are the same thing because they share a single trait when really they're vastly different. Just don't do it, it's a bad tactic. Uh, slippery slope, um, begging the question. So um, wouldn't you guys say Greg's kind of an asshole? That's begging the question, sorry Greg. <laughs> Um, whole category of, uh, of logical fallacies called red herrings. Uh, red herrings are arguments that are given in response to another argument, which is irrelevant and draws attention away from the subject of the argument. The tactic there is to shift the argument away from, from one that you won't win to something that's completely unrelated that, that you think you can win. So um, some of the uh, more specific examples that fall under that, uh, there's ad hominem, which is an attack on a person, um, appeal to emotion, um, Another, another good meme is relative privation, relative privation on the defense. Just because somebody did something worse doesn't make what you were doing right. So don't fall trap for that. And that's just, uh, the definition behind that one is dismissing an argument or complaint due to the existence of more important problems in the world, regardless of whether those problems bear relevance to the initial argument. Uh, the Wikipedia article referred to this as the, the first world problem. Um, there's another example would be straw man. That's where you kind of create your opponent's argument in a really crappy way so you can tear it apart. Um, and then two wrongs make a right. That's a logical fallacy. Um, and the last one, which is particularly timely, especially because uh, comrade Greg here just came back, um, <laughs> is called whataboutism. Um, so what about whataboutism? Um, this one in the US and the Western world is associated with Soviet and Russian propaganda. Uh, when, when criticisms were leveled at the Soviet Union during the Cold War, the Soviet's response would often be, what about, followed by an event in the Western world. So um, basically whenever the Soviets were accused of doing something wrong, their response would be, well, what about this thing the U.S. did? Um, and that comes from uh, Merriam-Webster, says this is, uh, it's trending again. So if everybody is guilty of something, is no one guilty of anything? Um, it's a form of false moral equivalence that attempts to discredit opponent's position by accusing hypocrisy. Don't do it. It's a logical fallacy. So, next. Cyber threat actor naming standard. Um, unlike some other things in uh, threat intelligence, there is a very specific standard of cyber threat. No, there isn't. 
there's absolutely no standard. So, um, Turn off, turn on. There we go. Okay. Woo. Yeah. Hey. Okay. So um, this comes from a really awesome blog post. Um, I'm going to say that a lot. So this one's from Florian Roth. They call it the Newcomer's Guide to Cyber Threat Actor Naming. It, it's, it's really good. Like, I highly recommend you read it. Um, and this slide is impossible to read. I apologize for that. Um, but so over here on the right, or on the left, this is a spreadsheet that he actually came up with. Um, You've got China, and then um, CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike, uh, their naming convention, they've got Comet Panda, Putter Panda, Gothic Panda, Numbered Panda, um, and then IRL, PLA Unit, PLA Unit, Kaspersky, Webmasters, Nikon, Spring Dragon, Dell SecureWorks is, Dell SecureWorks is really boring, and I'm really sad that none of the Dell SecureWorks guys are here, because um, I wanted to say that to their face. Uh, TG hyphen number, come on. Um, FireEye is Beavis, Deputy Dog, Kung Fu Kittens, uh, Symantec, Buckeye, Hidden Links, Eyesight, Brown Fox, UPS Team, Couch Team, Tri Cisco, Group, Group, Group. Oh, I skipped Mandiant. Mandiant. Uh, Mandiant's probably the, you know, the most well-known one, APT, APT number. Um, so some of those, uh, some of them even have really cool graphics. So uh, CrowdStrike is like their mark. We don't have to do this too many times. Okay, yeah, hopefully we won't have to do that too many times. Um, so, CrowdStrike, um, we've got Fancy Bear there on the left. That's Russia. Deep Panda, China in the middle, and Charming Kitten. So, uh, CrowdStrike does kind of have a convention. Um, the, the animal indicates the, the actor group, uh, typically uh, nation state, not always. Um, my f absolute favorite one uh, that they have recently for uh, the people distributing Gan Crab is uh, Pinchy Spider. Good. Uh, spider is, is cyber crime for them. But um, yeah, so pandas, China, kittens, Iran. And then um, the, the other part of it they come up with, I can't remember the name of it, but Fancy Bear and I can't remember the other one. But um, it actually came from Fancy Bear. I think the, the story is it came from um, somewhere in their code, there was a word that looked like fancy. And that's what, how they got Fancy Bear. So um, Kaspersky, I'm actually really partial to the Kaspersky ones. They All right, it's red. That means we have a connection. All right, intermission over. So, uh, yeah, I was saying, I really like the Kaspersky ones. They're these, like, super cool monsters. Um, so you got Crouching Yeti there on the left. That's Russia. Epic Turla, which is Russia. And Dark Hotel is unknown. So, um, yeah, threat actor naming. Um, so why isn't there a standard? Um, number of reasons. Um, 
There are, uh, and again, this comes from Florian's article. Um, these are his arguments, and I think they're phenomenal. So uh, I'm paraphrasing for him. So first is human reasons. So uh, human reasons could be an operation name or a malware name are used for a threat actor name. Um, sometimes vendors miss connections to other vendors' research. And sometimes news reports make uh, report inaccurate information. Um, I didn't include it, but he's got a screenshot where NBC just straight up got the information wrong from, uh, uh, oh shoot, I think it was, was it CrowdStrike? I don't remember. But um, uh, according to the article, they actually, they reached out to NBC and said, hey, like, you, need to, you need to fix that. And as of the point, a, as of the time he wrote the article, they still hadn't. So that's, that's a human reason that the, you could get different threat actor names. Um, second, technical reasons. So uh, technical reasons would be vendors see different parts of the picture. And that's what that, that picture is supposed to demonstrate. That's from his blog post. So, um, you know, you see that shape? You look at it from one side, it casts a shadow that looks like a square. The other side, you ca cast a shadow that looks like a circle. Um, it's the same shape, but depending on which way you look at it, depending on your perception, uh, you see it differently. So um, some of the different things that vendors could see, different TTPs, IOCs, uh, command and control, um, threat actors oftentimes actually join together or split up. Um, and a lot of times threat actors will share uh, tool sets or command and control infrastructure with other groups. Um, so those are technical reasons that, that you can get different threat actor names. Uh, lastly is operational reasons. So um, he makes a couple really, really great arguments for um, why there isn't a standard. And the first is that, um, you know, vendors, by using the name of another vendor, um, you may come to resent that decision later if that vendor takes it in a direction that you don't agree with. So if you, if you adopt another uh, vendor's naming standard and then they say, oh yeah, and they did this, and you say, no, wait to get it, that's a different actor group. Um, you know, at that point, you can't, you can't take that back. Um, and then the other reason is that by using another vendor's name, you kind of implicitly admit that the uh, research of the other vendor is more complete and could be seen as the basis for your research. So, um, you know, and, and vendors, they have a, the, the vendors that create this intelligence, uh, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, it's expensive. Um, they have, they have uh, you know, infrastructures, they have supplies backing them up. So they have a lot invested and, and they, they want to make sure that you understand that they, they did this work. So, um, the, and, and he makes the point, it's the, the same problem you see in the AV industry. Um, you know, you guys actually look at a, a virus total scan when you, when you put something in, it's like 37 things reported. How many of them are the same? Like, they, they're just all over the place. And it's, it's for the same reason. AV vendors aren't, aren't using each other's names. Um, so this causes a number of problems. Um, the first is that uh, a vendor tracks multiple groups where another vendor only sees a single group. That's a possibility. Um, another one is where two operations could be falsely attributed to a single group. And a uh, third one he argues is operations are attributed to a group based on a part of the IOC cluster that a different vendor maps to another group. Um, so, and, and before I move on to the next slide, I did want to say, uh, he, he kind of caps it up as saying that, that he doesn't think the naming convention is, is as big of a problem. Um, as long as vendors, uh, typically they do a pretty good job of it, but as long as vendors do a good job of kind of mapping their groups to other vendor groups and, and making those connections where possible. Um, but uh, as someone who has made a spreadsheet like that, I can tell you um, it, it can get confusing. Um, so anyway. These problems, uh, it can lead to conflicting analysis. And that actually happened uh, like two months ago. Um, so there was a news article, uh, right country, wrong group. Reacher, reacher, uh, researchers say it wasn't APT10 that hacked Norwegian software firm. So um, this happened, like I said, yeah, this it was like February, I believe, um, January, February. So recorded future and rapid seven, two pretty big uh, Intel, Intel names. Um, they went ahead and they, they made a report blaming APT10 for an attack on a Norwegian software firm. Um, and they said, you can see there, they actually said it was in high confidence. They claimed their assessment um, was based on the malware use, uh, a signature backdoor, and uh, cited those as, as factors in their attribution. Um, unfortunately, uh, only one problem. So, you know, very solid deductive reasoning. Like, they, they had good reasons for saying this is APT10. I uh, even said a DOJ indictment. So, only problem was that PwC and Microsoft very publicly contradicted them. Um, they said that the attack uh, was attributed to a different APT that they call APT31, and Microsoft is calling Draconium. So, uh, that, that first 
quote from the top is from uh, Chris McConkery. He's the head of cyber threat detection and response at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, and they, they said that there is some overlap in the hacking tools and that APT10 and APT31 both conduct supply chain attacks, but that there are subtle differences in their infrastructure. Um, and for what it's worth, um, ultimately the recorded future and Rapid7 report uh, kind of caveated their, their attribution by saying that the investigation of the breaches included, quote, privileged conversations that lead us to believe in the future portions of what is now known as APT10 will be recategorized as a new group. There's insufficient data at this time to make that distinction. So they, they kind of, they backed down from their attribution claim, um, but did so kind of, you know, saving face. So. And yeah, that, that goes straight into attribution. Uh, hashtag attribution. So attribution is a lot of times that's what people think of when they think of threat intel. Um, it's, it's supposed to be the sexy part of threat intel. The, uh, they did it. Um, only there's some problems though. Uh, the first one is that attribution is hard. Attribution is really hard. Um, second is attribution may not honestly matter. Um, and I, I know uh, a number of Intel companies and, you know, CISOs are probably, you know, screaming at me right now. But um, the important things to ask yourself, will attribution change your response? Um, you know, and this, this is, this is kind of targeted as at, at you, the, the analyst, the responder, um, at your company, at what you're doing. Is attribution going to change your response? Is it going to change the way you're responding to an incident? Is it going to change, uh, you know, your, your detection methods? Anything like that. Um, and could the resources spent on attribution be better spent elsewhere? Uh, important questions. Uh, I'm not saying that attribution doesn't matter. I'm not saying that nobody gets any value from it. I'm saying that you need to, to discover that for yourself. Um, so everybody loves the pyramid of pain. So you need to ask yourself, do you really care who did it? Or do you really want to know how do I identify them? Um, now, that being said, if you have everything else figured out, by all means, do attribution. If you're a nation state and attribution matters, you know, you better be doing attribution. If, if you're going to retaliate, then you need to be doing attribution. But, you know, is your company going to retaliate against China? Probably not. Uh, yeah, I like this one. So, uh, Instead of the pyramid of pain, there is a, uh, another framework that I found online by our very own Ryan Stillians called the detection maturity levels. So um, I really like this one. So he, he proposes detection maturity level uh, zero is none or unknown uh, from, from one up to eight. And um, I, I thought it mapped, I, I like it because it's, it's similar to the pyramid, pyramid of pain, but um, I think there's, there's more to it. Um, and it's same thing though, you've got one and two, Atomic indicators, host and network artifacts, um, and then those can be grouped together as evidence left during or after the attack, uh, after the act. Um, in the middle there, you have your TTPs, tactics, techniques, procedures, and tools, and that's how they plan to get it. And then up there at the top, uh, the one thing I, the where this uh, model actually makes a distinction: goals and strategy, which is what they want. Um, and actually, somebody else actually expanded on this. I don't know, Ryan, did you know about that? Yeah. Um, so that one's kind of hard to read, um, but they added a ninth level for attacker identity. Um, and that comes from a 2017 research paper called Cyber Threat Intelligence Model and Evaluation of Taxonomies, Taxonomies, Sharing Standards and Ontologies Within Cyber Threat Intelligence. So um, yeah, so you can, you can see that attacker identity, it could matter, sometimes it does matter, but I mean, you, bet, you better have everything else figured out or, or you better have a need for attribution if you're, if you're chasing that. Um, so, and in some cases, attribution can even cost you. So um, this happened earlier this year. Um, there are actually two lawsuits now, but um, the one that I picked for this is um, Mandala's International. So they are the, um, they, they're this uh, spinoff from Kraft Foods. Um, they're big, big company. I think they're like, uh, 2018, they were like Fortune 102. Um, so they are actually uh, suing Zurich ins Insurance in Illinois State Court for refusing to pay their $100 million claim for damages caused by the 2017 Not Pet Ye attack. Um, 
And the, the thing is, Zurich apparently rejected Mandalas' claim on the grounds that Not Pet Yet was an act of war and therefore excluded from coverage under its policy agreement. Um, so Not Pet Yet, I don't know if you guys remember, 2017, Big Attack, it was one of the, it was It and Wanna Cry were, were kind of the two based on um, uh, Eternal Blue. Um, it started, that was the one where, um, widely attributed to the Russians, started in Ukraine using um, uh, Doc, what was it? I can't remember the name of the software, uh, tax software in Ukraine. And then it just spread. Um, but um, the US, the UK, um, and uh, Australia, and one of the five, five eyes groups, but um, and basically diplomatic, uh, part of a diplomatic agreement all came out and said, Russia did this, this is bad. So uh, multiple countries publicly attributed Russia to the Not Petya attack. And um, as a result, there are now two cases. Uh, this, is, this is the one in the US. Um, there's another case where a, um, was it a uh, British law firm is suing their insurance provider for the same, same reason. Their insurance uh, provider denied the claim uh, that Not Petya, um, their, their claim based on Not Petya by saying that it falls under the ex uh, war exclusion. So both of these cases are still pending. Um, potential to have a uh, pretty significant legal precedent. Odds are they'll both be settled. Um, I believe the, the UK one is actually in uh, arbitration instead of a, a lawsuit, but we'll see, we'll see what uh, comes of that. Yeah, so the, um, the Mandalas' uh, what was it, their, their uh, coverage was a general, general uh, coverage claim. But um, they argue that it, it should cover the damages. Um, so again, potential to have pretty significant uh, legal, uh, legal precedent. So, um, all right, in conclusion, I hope you guys had some uh, takeaways from my insanely long talk. Hey, it's under an hour. Uh, so first is, uh, you know, I hope you, I hope you have a better understanding of cyber threat intelligence, uh, the role it plays in kind of cyber, cyber defense operations as a whole. Um, hopefully you, you have some sort of able to determine or some sort of ability now to determine whether cyber threat intelligence can benefit you in your day job or benefit some of your clients, depending on uh, what, what sort of business you work in. And uh, lastly, um, you know, I, I hope you maybe have a, some sort of an idea of uh, how you might evaluate analysis and intelligence sources, either either your own news sources or, or intelligence reports. So, um, yeah. And with that, um, you know, remember there are a lot of snake oil salespeople out there. A um, lot of companies trying to sell threat intelligence these days. So uh, kind of, you know, ask yourself what they're selling. Uh, really take a look at it. So um, this is a uh, little Bobby. Uh, at the end there, it says "Threat Intelligence in Me" is a uh, is a little Bobby book that's that's available. I haven't picked it up yet, but I fully intend to. So, um, guy in the middle there, he says, "Little Bobby says Threat Intelligence." I don't even understand what that is. And the guy in the middle says, "Even better, buy this and solve all your cyber problems." And the last panel is Little Bobby says, "No thanks, I'll do my own research first. So, be like Little Bobby, do your own research. Um, so yeah, like I said, um, sources, additional resources. Um, I, I do plan on putting this up on, on YouTube, so I'll, I'll post it up there. And then uh, also, I'll probably also put them in Slack. So um, with that, anybody have any questions? No questions, none? All righty. Thank you, guys.